Between Americans, starring Orson Welles. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater. The Gulf Oil Companies and your good Gulf dealer are proud to present a dramatic picture of this, Our America. Here is your host, Roger Pryor, to tell you about it. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you tonight to one of the most timely programs ever heard on the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Our production of Norman Colwyn's script, Between Americans, starring Orson Welles. Broadcast at any time, we believe this program would make every American's heart beat a little faster. Make him hold his head just a little higher. But since the tragic and foreboding news that came today, this program between Americans now becomes an American odyssey. In just a moment, our story will begin. But first, here's Bud Heaston. Right. And here's an easy way to change from a pessimist into an optimist. If you're wondering now how long you may have to keep your present car, and wondering, too, if it will last... If it will stay in good condition, just look on the bright side of the picture. Remember, when you give the wearing parts of your car good protection, that helps it stay young and act young a long, long time. So give your automobile the modern method of lubrication, Goflex registered lubrication. Here's why. First, expert Goflex operator works from a master chart of your model car, thus protects each wearing point in the chassis and body. Second, the Goflex man uses not just one or two greases, but six special lubricants, especially developed by lubrication authorities. And third, here's proof of how good these lubricants are. In recent tests by Gulf engineers, Goflex chassis lubricant, for instance, stayed in the shackles 30% better and lubricated nearly 100% longer than the average of competitive products tested. So get Gulflex registered lubrication, a much better than usual grease job at no extra cost. Remember, too, that your good Gulf dealer is also ready with splendid motor oils and gasolines, such as Gulf No-Nox gasoline, the extra-value gasoline that has been especially designed to stop harmful pounding and hammering inside your engine. Make it a habit to stop regularly at your neighborhood good Gulf dealers, your headquarters for making your car last longer. And now, Oscar Bradley's music introduces Orson Welles, who will talk between Americans. This program is Between Americans. That's where the title comes in. We hope you like it, but you don't have to. At any rate, nobody's going to make you stick around and listen to it. That's one of the advantages of being an American. Now, tonight we're doing something quite foreign to the type of thing usually presented by the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Instead of telling a story about five or six people, we're telling a story about a hundred million. This happens to include you, listener, whatever your name may be. As a matter of fact, names don't bother real Americans very much. Not when we've got states named after French kings and English queens are lifted right out of the Latin language like Montana or out of the Spanish like Nevada and towns. You know, if you were to hold a convention of all the people who live in foreign-sounding American towns, we could fill quite a sizable stadium. Among the delegates registering on the first day would be... Me, I'm the delegate from London. Minnesota. I'm in from Dublin, New Hampshire. Flew in this morning from Cairo, Illinois. Huh? Uh, whose turn, me? Uh, I'm from Canton, Connecticut. I'm from Paris, Texas. I came all the way from Shanghai, West Virginia. Warsaw, Georgia. I'm the delegate representing Moscow, Kentucky. My town is Toronto, Kansas. As for me, Lisbon, Maine. Delegate from Madrid, Alabama reporting. I'm from Stockholm, South Dakota. Drove down this afternoon from Bombay, New York. Hitchhiked here from Baghdad, Florida. All right, delegates, now that you've registered, you may all be seated. Now, that's all the preliminaries there's going to be tonight. We're through with the introductions, the overture, and the official registration. So now we can get down to the text, which is roughly speaking this. Today, particularly, 
people are thinking about their country pretty hard. Some of them for the first time in their lives. People are wondering where we're headed. Men are being called on to get ready to defend America. A lot of them are thinking in terms of what is there to defend. Well, now, America means a lot of things to a lot of people. Most of them are solid patriots, only they don't know it. They don't have to wear a red and white and blue button in their lapels to prove it. They don't have to agree with or even listen to people like this. My fellow citizens, in this great state of Florida and Pethero, we can pick the dog squirtle your taxes. Our great country is gribbly bolted up and can wackle tabblewick and your lager and I will arrive, herring done forever. We got a good hunch most people prefer the quiet kind of speaker like the fellow who got up on a platform in a Pennsylvania town one day and said, The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. That was the Gettysburg Address he was referring to. As a matter of fact, he didn't get such good reviews the next morning. Take, for example, the write-up he got in the Harrisburg Patriot. We pass over the silly remarks of the president. For the credit of the nation, we are willing that they shall no more be repeated and thought of. If you think that's bad, listen to what the Chicago Times had to say. The cheek of every American must tingle with shame as he reads the silly, flat and dishwatery utterances of the man who has to be pointed out to intelligent foreigners as the President of the United States. Of course, the rival paper in Chicago took the opposite point of view. Rival papers often do. The remarks of President Lincoln will live among the annals of man. That paper gave it four stars, and they were right. The Gettysburg Address did survive. But that business of calling a president a ham is really something to be proud of. I mean the right to print a piece saying a president makes a sound like dishwater. Nobody dragged the editors off to jail, even if they were wrong. That's important comes under the heading of free press. As soon as anybody starts gagging the press, any press, watch out. Americans don't like that. And by the way, we got a nerve to be calling ourselves Americans all the time when we're really only United Staters. We're a little selfish about that. It's America down there in Chile, too. All the way down the spine of the Andes. If any of you folks are hearing this down around Mexico or... Honduras, or Salvador, or Argentina, or even if you're an Eskimo in the Arctic. We hope you'll overlook our calling ourselves Americans as though we were the only ones in the hemisphere. We do that just because it's so much easier to say than anything else, and also because it sounds so good. By the way, before we leave the subject, what about the original American? The Indians? There's a forgotten race for you. How about the Indian on the nickel and the buffalo who roamed the back of the great American jit? Seems a shame. No two ways about it. We have forgotten those 100% Americans who went down to quarantine to meet the Mayflower. We don't see them around in person very much these days. But their ghosts are still with us. Maybe the red men are forgotten. Maybe not. But between you and us, it's said that near Boonesboro, Kentucky, on certain nights in November, by the light of the waning moon, some very peculiar ghost meetings go on in the woods south of the river. Also in certain parts of the Alleghenies, between the hours of sundown and the coming of the morning mist. Yes. If you happen to be listening to this in a car, driving along Highway 99 in Wyoming. That man you passed walking down the road a few miles back wasn't a man at all. Seriously, they were brave people. The Indians fought a losing fight against great odds wanted nothing more than to keep their land and their way of life. Fighting the fight so many people of all races have had to fight since. The fight to keep free and independent. The fight to stop men from the outside who want to civilize somebody their way. 
You ever ask yourself what America means to you? Does it mean 1776? Columbia, the gem of the ocean? Big business? The Bill of Rights? Uncle Sam? Chances are it means none of these things. Chances are it means something very personal to each of you. Something close to your heart, which you'd miss like the very blazes if you were stranded abroad. Might have nothing at all to do with quotes from Madison or acts of Congress. It might be just the feeling about the crisp autumns in New England and the smell of burning leaves. It might be the memory of the way they smooth off the infield between the games of a doubleheader. It might be a thing as small as your little finger. Have you ever been abroad and run out of American cigarettes? Hey, uh, speak English, mister? No, senor. Solo hablo espanol. Well, anyway, uh, do you carry cigarettes? Ah, cigarillo. Si, tenemos bastante aquí. No, I just want cigarettes. Uh, here, I'll take these. How much? Veinte centavos. Yeah, keep the change. Hey, uh, got a light there, senor? Si, como no, senor. Un mananto. <coughs> hey, what is this? Soft, cold soup? <laughs> Tastes like an old shoe. Here, you can smoke the rest of them. Oy. There you are. America might mean a tight pack cigarette, which tastes good. Might mean the way a hot dog man slaps mustard on a Frank. Might mean going with your wife to the movie on bank night. Or taking your girl to the annual barn dance and social at Tuckerman's Barn. Plenty of you listeners know what I'm talking about. You hear people speak of home defense? This is the home. The home to be defended. The square dance down the Glen of East. No man Tuckerman's barn. This is the America of all the couples dancing there tonight. That's what the nation means to Butch and Fred and Jenny and Alvira. And... This is America to all the boys and girls from Malvern County and their folks at home waiting for them. What do you suppose America means to that auto repair man in the grease cake dungarees who works in the garage in the corner of Willow and Elm Street? It means, quite likely, crawling under the 1936 Buick and dragging an electric light bulb on a long extension after him. Hey, Joe, hand me that wrench. What wrench? The wrench at your feet. I got to finish this apprentice job. Why don't he sell that jalopy and get a new boat? Hey, you want to talk us out of business? As long as he keeps his car, we get a repair job once in a while. Yeah, guess you're right. Sure. That's America to Pete and Joe. Piston job, transmission job, valve job, jack it up, change the tire. New fan belt, check the pump. On Saturday night, take the girl down to Joyland Dance Park. Means repairs to those boys and cans of oil and carburetor mixtures. And to Jack Prentice, who owns the Buick that Pete is fixing and who lives down on the beach near the Coast Guard station, America means the sound and the sight and the smell of high tide under the full moon, and occasionally the melancholy note of the bellboy drifting up when the wind's blowing in from the ship channel. It means the age-old sound of the sea, the same sound folks are hearing this very minute up around Penobscot Bay in Winthrop Beach and Chincoteague Inlet down by Calabogue Sound and on Boca Chica and then clean over to the other coast by Guadalupe, Carmel. Yes. Wind and wave and sand and rock and riptide and undertow. That's America to Jack Prentice and the hundreds of thousands of folks settled on the coastlines between Eastport and Key West, Point Isabel and Birch Bay. America is all things to all our people. Prairie to Nebraskans, coal to Scranton miners, cameras and raw celluloid to the picture boys in Hollywood, 
the stink of crude oil to the men who work the wells. Relief checks to the unemployed. A mic and a stopwatch to a radio production man. A BMT Express to Brooklyn office workers. Sure, that's the way it goes. Or isn't it? What does this country mean to you? It might mean anything. Anything at all. It might mean a course in highfalutin poetry at Harvard. Today, gentlemen, we will consider the influence of Whitman on the development of poetry in America. And by 1870, after 12 years of incessant attack against squeamish over-refinements, Whitman really began to create an active distaste for literary effects. Or else it might be an argument between two baseball fans as to which is the better team, the Yankees or the Red Sox. Yeah, but look! The Yanks are a bunch of old men and cripples. Yeah, yeah. They won't last. I tell you, they yeah. won't last. Well, it gets good and hot around the middle of July. Yeah. Well, look, double hitters begin piling up. What are you talking? Listen, the man's just having the best season he ever had. Ah. He's an old man, huh? Keller hitting a dozen homers. Ah. I'd like to be a cripple like that. No home run record for the club. Won't last, huh? Who's the Red Sox got as good as the marriage? Name one guy. Name one. I'll name two. Ted Williams. Well, a good hitter. No getting away from that. What you say? Better than the man? Pitching. Wait a minute. Do you say... Or it could be a poker game in Charlie Ferreter's law office upstairs over the five and ten cent store on a rainy afternoon. Or a meeting of the Kiwanis Club in the mansion house on Thursday. Or the news store. Or a great symphony concert sent out over everybody there playing the music of all the world's great composers regardless of their race or nationality. For instance, something by a great German Jew named Mendelssohn. Something you couldn't play in certain countries on the other side. Now let's stop a minute and figure this out. Is it an accident that makes just being a citizen in this comparatively young country so attractive to so many people? To the world's greatest skater from Norway? To the world's greatest mathematician from Germany? To the world's greatest orchestra conductor from Italy? Is it an accident that a thousand million people all around the world would give everything they own to be in your shoes? A free citizen of this country, right this very minute? Is it the weather here? Let's ask some of the natives. You from New York, how's the weather out your way? Oh, I like it all right, only the summers give me a pain, sticky and hot. And then we usually get a stretch of terrible overcast weather around April and November. Sometimes ten days go by without the sun coming out once. And you, miss, from Miami, Florida. Oh, our climate's fine. Except you have to watch out for sunburn. A gentleman from Kansas? Well, summers get pretty hot. Winter's pretty cold. Tornadoes raise a ruckus every once in a while. Los Angeles. You. Ah, wonderful climate. Magnificent. Don't you ever get tired of all that sunshine? Ah, <laughs> no, sir. Not a bit. <laughs> Never rain? Well, a little precipitation, maybe, but no rain. <laughs> No earthquake? No, just a little one. Are you interested in some real estate? Uh, no, thanks. Oh. <laughs> and uh, you from San Francisco, uh, how about it there? Best climate in the world, top. Lots of sunshine? Lots. Lots of fog? A lot. All right. <laughs> then it's not the weather which makes us so attractive. Is it maybe our wine, women, and song? Let's ask the experts. Uh, you there, expert on women. American women are beautiful, certainly. But we've never produced any classic or historic beauty. We've no legendary figure to compare with Helen of Troy, or with any of the Greek or Roman Venuses, or with Egypt's Cleopatra. As far as fiction is concerned, we can offer nobody to stand up against Italy's Juliet, or Germany's Isolde, or France's Roxanne. Certainly not Scarlett O'Hara. Certainly not. No, indeed. All right, that's fine. Thanks very much. Now, what about our wines? Is that what makes America so attractive from the outside looking in? How about it, wine expert? American wines are excellent, but then, of course, meaning no offense, have you ever heard of French champagne, burgundy, libre All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Can it be our song? 
Maestro. America can well be proud of its composers and of its wealth of folk music. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that we have yet to produce a single world great symphony, whereas Finland has produced seven, Germany and Austria half a hundred, the Russians about twelve, the French two or three, England two or three, Bohemia... Not song, then. Neither wine, women, nor song. So what is it, then? Well, it's this. Come right down to it. It's the spectacle of nearly 150 million people trying to live up to the expectations of a handful of great men who lived and died 150 years ago. Men who were so fed up with the kind of government they'd been getting, they sat down and wrote a new constitution for themselves and their children. A democratic constitution that's been added to but never been topped before or since. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The right of trial by jury shall be preserved. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. The right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Or on account of sex. Those are pretty good sentiments to be kept alive and flourishing in the world today. Of course, there are other things that makes our union a good one to belong to. It's a beautiful country, even though it has a lot of incorrigible badlands and corrigible slums. Aren't many countries have as much in them to look at and wonder about as this one? This can be a rather fierce country, too. Ever see the way its mountains frown down sometimes? Know what they're frowning at? Some rumors they heard about petty intrigue, about political bosses and shysters and fakers and grafters and men who make a business of chipping the people. Ever see the way the sky suddenly gets black and the thunder roars and the lightning starts throwing itself around? Ever see a storm whipping it up across the Great Lakes? That's how the American winds feel about anybody who denies anybody else a fair trial or free speech, or the right to assemble, or the right to worship as one sees fit. Well then, in the final analysis, there can be no analysis. Many great thinkers and poets have attempted it, but the country's too big for any one man. There's Walt Whitman and Carl Sandburg and Tom Wolfe, and they all felt the magnitude and magnificence of the nation that got put together piece by piece like a jigsaw puzzle. They felt it and wrote about it in unforgettable ways. But still, it's bigger than any of them, or any of us. Whitman hit it on the nose when he said it was bigger than the president and the cabinet in the District of Columbia. It's not Park Avenue, or Broadway, or 42nd Street, or the Loop, or the Golden Triangle. It's other things. Many, many, many other things. Mill towns. Steel towns. Tobacco towns. Mining towns. Oil towns. Cotton towns. Farmhouses. Railroad sightings. Statues on the common. Tourist houses on the edge of town along the state highway. Swimming holes. Gas stations. Strollers on Main Street. Kettles of sorghum molasses. Sunday papers. Season tickets to concerts. Auctioneers. Night courts. Radios. Parades. Toothpaste. Shaving cream. Dogs. Cats. Skyscrapers. Subways. Cornfields, offices, hotel rooms, airports, hospitals, factories... Oh, we could go on for weeks with this, never come any closer to a working definition of America. But to any real understanding of its total meaning... Look. 
How can you add up all the red and yellow neon signs, the smell of all the eggs and bacon frying in the morning, the bargain specials, the lessons learned, the cows let in from pasture, the mileage clocked up on automobile speedometers, the rainfall and the snowfall, and the wind drift. It's much too big for you, or me, or any of us who happen to stand alone or in small groups. It's much too great for any person or any party. Too much love by all its people, loved in spite of and because of its faults and virtues and its past mistakes and future promises. America is not a map, a poem, an almanac, a mural, a building in the heart of Washington. It's a territory possessed by people, possessed by an ideal. Well, that's all, listeners. Just wanted to talk between Americans for a half hour of a Sunday evening. No big finish here. No brass section bringing down the curtain. Just a little music to follow a friendly little chat. Good night, Americans. You've just heard Orson Welles talking between Americans. has just spoken to you as one American to another. And incidentally, do you remember when Orson mentioned the hundreds of thousands of Americans working in those oil towns and gas stations? Well, those Americans make up a great industry that's a vital part of America, the oil industry. There are about 400,000 gasoline dealers helping traffic flow along the highways, making possible business trips, visits to your friends, the stores and movies, pleasant rides in the country. That's only part of the oil industry's contribution to making the American way of life the grand thing it is. And to keep it that way, to safeguard our way of life, well, the industry's helping there, too. It's supplying fuels and lubricants for factories busy turning out materials for our defense. In addition, the oil industry is supplying all the gas and oil needs of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. And for the vastly augmented Air Force planned in the future, Gulf and other oil companies are building enough 100 octane aviation fuel plants to take care of the increased demand. That's only a glimpse of what the oil industry, of which Gulf is a part, means today to the American people and the American way of life. For next week, we really have a show that'll put you into a great humor. The RKO hit... My Life with Caroline, starring those top favorites, William Powell and Anne Southern with George Barbier. Music by Oscar Bradley, assisted by Frank Tours. Until then, this is Roger Pryor speaking for your neighborhood good golf dealer and saying, good night, everyone. Orson Welles appeared tonight through the courtesy of Lady Esther and is currently making the magnificent Ambersons at RKO. Don't forget our date next week when the Gulf Screen Guild Theater brings you William Powell, Ann Southern, and George Barbier in My Life with Caroline. But Houston speaking, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>